Hello and welcome back after your lunch break. I hope you managed to enjoy some of the sun. It's certainly a lovely sunny day up here in Aberdeen. So thanks very much for joining us for this afternoon part of Building for the Future. We certainly had a great morning and I'm very much looking forward to having lots of great conversations this afternoon. And we would very much like you to be a part of the conversation in this session. So please add your comments and questions in the Q&A on the side panel via Slido. And I'll be picking these up throughout the session rather than waiting until the end, as we're hoping to try and get through quite a few different topics this afternoon. And you can also keep the conversation going throughout and afterwards on social media using the hashtag ISM Future. So the whole conference is about looking forward and we're focusing in this session specifically on teaching music post COVID. So I've been doing a lot of reflecting as I'm sure we all have about past, present and future and what that might look like in connection to music education. It's been mind blowing trying to figure out what is allowed or not allowed and the ISM have been fantastic at signposting us for the ever changing regulations across all four nations and we have all four nations represented in this webinar today. And over the year we've had to think about oh, tech availability, upskilling for some with regard to using tech, online safeguarding, new modes of teaching which we could call pedagogy for a digital age, digital exams, and creative solutions for things. Musicians have been affected socially and emotionally by the pandemic with livelihoods under threat in many instances. However, music teachers have also been a lifeline for enabling others to continue to make music, which has been a real boost for health and well-being for many. I asked some of my university students about their experiences of online learning and one said, Especially in times like the one we have experienced, and we are still experiencing, it seems that through technology our lives may not be forced to be paused. And a couple of instrumental tutors I spoke with recently have remarked that their students have made better progress than they expected through teaching online, and better than they thought they would have done had they been face to face. And I know that some have not coped so well. And I know that colleagues in some schools have faced a lot of restrictions with what they have been able, allowed to do, so things are mixed. Um, I play in a new music ensemble and I've really enjoyed playing in a lockdown composing project where composers were commissioned to write music, embracing the challenges of playing live on Zoom. So this was music reimagined for the space, not just trying to fit something old into something new. One piece required a lot of improvisation, and some of the classical musicians remarked that being behind a Zoom screen made it far easier to undertake this. They would have been less confident to approach this had they been physically in a room. Mm -hmm. So I know we're all undoubtedly desperate to get back to playing face-to-face -face and teaching music in rooms with people when it's safe to do so. And I believe in England and Northern Ireland, things are moving a little faster than they are up here in Scotland, but we are gradually beginning to move out of lockdown now. And instead of reverting back to how things were, I wonder what we will keep, what we will have learned, and how we can reimagine the future. So I'm delighted to introduce our panel for today when we will be discussing some of these things and I'm sure some more things. So I'm going to introduce our fantastic panel now. We have John Robinson, the ISM's he Head of Legal and Compliance, and there is nothing he does not know about the legal and business side of teaching, including employment status and safeguarding, as well as COVID-19 guidance in all the four nations. We have Sharon Mark Tegart from Northern Ireland, who is a piano teacher and director of Curious Piano Teachers. And she founded Evoco in 2012, which is Northern Ireland's music education organisation specialising in piano teacher training. And I love this particular statement from her website, which is, being curious has taken me to places I never thought I'd reach. I love that. We have Steph Power, who is the chair of the Welsh Music Centre, T. Kerth. I apologise to all our Welsh listeners. I've tried to get that right. She's also a composer, a writer and a critic. And she is passionate about outreach and education. And she's conducted many composition and songwriting workshops. She enjoys working with young people as an examiner for Trinity College London. And that's one of the specialisms she'll be commenting on today. And we also have James Lewis, who is a risk advisor for Deloitte. He's also a semi-professional tuba player and he is experienced looking after West End and Broadway shows, as well as being a health and safety professional. So a real varied mix in our panel today. 
So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to some of the questions. And as I said, please, please, please put your comments in Slido so that you can interact with us as we go. So the first topic that we're going to discuss today is about health and safety, which is high on the agenda of everyone. Um, so first question, and I'm going to put this one to James, first of all. Um, so how has COVID impacted health and safety considerations? And what do teachers need to consider in terms of risk to protect themselves and their pupils as face-to-face -face lessons are now starting to resume? James, would you like to comment on that question, first of all? Oh, thanks, Pauline. Hi everyone. So I, th I think um, there are there are a couple of considerations really where you can compare the the current situation to the start of the pandemic. And I think when we look at the start of the pandemic, a lot of people were risk adverse. Um, there were a huge amount of unknowns uh, from a health impact point of view. You know what what denominations, what age group, how would it impact people in what ways, um, and, and fundamentally how, how was it transmitted from person to person. Um, and sort of that unknown of how things will develop. And if, 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 we, if we compare to the situation today, um, I think there are a lot more knowns, you know, from, from the impact point of view, the, the spread, which, which enables you to look at how to implement controls. Um, and I think if you compare that to, to, to traditional health and safety, um, it, it sort of almost sits a little bit out, outside of the wheelhouse because it's it's more about occupational health and it's more about looking looking from a health perspective of how to control infection prevention and control uh, principles or how to implement IPC principles rather than traditional health and safety control measures of risk assessment and, 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 and risk. And but, but saying that there are still I think a considerable number of unknowns because as we hear on the news, there are of various um, variants with specific variants of concern, and the government is still working out how those variants impact on individuals. So I think, al although we are now sort of more risk accepting, we we understand a little bit more. Perhaps which we are taking a little bit more risk in, in the way we're doing things. Um, we still need to be incredibly careful. And, and implement some of those controls, which which we can go on to talk about. And I think that that fear of the unknown instills um, still quite quite a bit of fear, which impacts obviously on psychological health, um, which which in turn then impacts on our physical health because both are intrinsically linked. You can't you cannot impact your your physical health without impacting your psychological health, and vice versa, positively or negatively. Um, Along with that, I think one of the reasons we've got that bit of a fear of unknown is there are still confusing messages out there. There are still myths out there, i.e., you know, what 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 controls work, what what controls don't work, how, how long can we play for, how can we, how long can we break for, how frequent should we break? Um, and then again, that, that that lockdown that we've the, the numerous lockdowns that we've had, again impacting on. On psychological and physical health. So I, I think when we, you know, wrapping that up into an answer on how has COVID impact health and safety considerations, we've we've moved from I think a, a traditional health and safety approach to more of an approach that you see in hospitals and healthcare, um, where you're looking at dealing with IPC principles such as hand hygiene, space. To, to quote the message, hands, face, space, and fresh air. That. They, they are the approaches which which work in hospitals from an infection prevention point of view. And then I think when, when we move on to perhaps what do teachers need to consider um, to, to protect themselves and their pupils, it's it, it is you know what we we've, we've talked about previously. There are social distancing you know there's social distancing, making sure that you've got two meters or at least one meters plus where you can't get that two meters. The ventilation, so outside is best, you know, when we when we look at that, you've, you've got ample amount of fresh air constantly. However, in, inside with some very good ventilation and airflow through is also good. Um, the hand washing and sanitizing of hands before entering somebody else's house uh, from a face-to-face -face in, in house point of view. And also how, how do you separate people with screens, if, if it's possible, 
Um, that, that could be sitting either side of the door, could be um, it, it, perhaps curing some plastic screens. And I, and I think also looking at how different households will, will come into contact with each other. So if, if you've got lessons at home, for example, start staggering the start times of those lessons. So, you, so firstly, you have a bit of time to, to clean touch points and physical points between lessons. Um, but also so that households don't sort of unexpectedly uh, join together. And then I think one of, one of the things which every single person, I, I believe, John, you might need to keep me honest on this one, but I believe every single person in the UK now has access to lateral flow devices, which they can regularly get from Test and Trace in England. Uh, I think it's Test and Protect in Scotland, um, NS, uh, HSENI in, in, in Ireland, and um, through Test, Protect and Trace in Wales. I think that's all of the names. Again, keep, keep, me, keep, keep me honest if not. And again, I, I think that that is a significant way of controlling transmission risk. Because if you know, if, if somebody is asymptomatic, um, in, in the vast majority of cases, um, sensitivity is about 80% 80, 80 on those lateral flow devices. It will pick up um, within the first five days where people generally don't show um, symptoms. So being able to control that and know with a level of certainty that somebody coming into your home when you're teaching perhaps is not infectious, will help you look at what other sensible controls you could look at. Does that mean you could perhaps re remove some of the screens and, and just use space and elsewhere? So I, I think that's, that's an encompassing view from, from me. I don't know if there are any other colleagues, John, if you've got any thoughts on that. Thank you very much, James. Um, it's very, very clear and very helpful um, to have your informed perspective on this as a, as a specialist. I don't think there's anything I want to add um, particularly, um, other than just to pick up on your remark about the lateral flow test. Yes, I think you're right um, that these are now readily available and employers certainly have the opportunity to get them um, free in England if you registered by the 12th of April. Um, so it's a good thing, um, as you say, if we can know what's going on, we can then take steps accordingly. We can decide what it is that we think is going to be appropriate in the circumstances. Whether we're an employer, just as you know, the ISM is having this conversation ourselves about, well, what do we do when we go back into the office, all this stuff. But also, if you're an individual teacher, what's going to be relevant for you? So, James, thank you very much for your, your very clear pointers on that. Thank you, uh, James and John. Could I um, just check? There, there's one um, question which came up in the chat, which I think you have answered, which was how safe is it to teach at home in the present situation? But one thing which um, may be worth um, just talking to is if, if somebody is teaching in somebody else's home, what, are there any other considerations? Because I know many people travel to teach in other people's homes. Are there extra things which people have to consider? I, I think it's it's making making some of the unknowns known. It's it's perhaps asking before you get there, ha, has anybody in the household had any symptoms or signs of symptoms in the last X amount of time frame? Again, any any previous teachers or any previous um, pupils that have been there that have potentially had signs or symptoms that have been picked up during the lesson, possibly even. Um, and, and making a sort of informed choice on whether or not that's that's right for that individual and how that that teacher is impacted and their family is impacted. I think that's one element of it. And I, and I think um, never assume. So so never assume that something is clean. Never assume that somebody has gone to the trouble of, of cleaning touch points and the area that you're going to be in. So it, it's. And, and, and I think we're all fundamentally aware of what's going on in the pandemic. So having a conversation about, well, would you mind removing unnecessary things from that area, which could be touch points? I think it's, do you mind if I use a wipe, which is a joint detergent and disinfectant to wipe those touch points? Um, and, and I think that's, that, that's, that's, that's a good point just to, to touch on because, touch on touch points, still pardon the pun, um, some, some wipe, cleaning wipes that are being used are just disinfectants. That means it won't necessarily remove the biological matter before disinfecting the, the substance underneath. And, and you just need to take a close look on what you're using to clean. And although most 
household cleaners will do that. If you're particularly worried about it, there are products out there with a, which are a joint detergent and disinfectant, which has a contact time of one minute, which is also not abrasive. So any viral matter that is within that area will, will be killed and removed by the time that that product is dry. So I think it's, it's make unknowns known and never assume. So um, try and make space, try not to touch things. And, and if you're unsure and, and have other health considerations, really evaluate, is that the right thing to do for you? Bear in mind that the national prevalence is very low at the moment, which is why we're coming out of lockdown as well. So taking into consideration that external view, if you've got oversight of what's happening in different geographical locations, local authorities and, and parishes within local authorities, also take a look at some of that data to perhaps reassure yourself if that is the right thing to do. Thank you. Um, we have another question, um, and this would be for people um, teaching from home. Somebody is saying, if teaching at home, can students pass masked in the corridor? I guess if maybe they have a waiting room at home, and so what's the procedure for, you know, one in, one out, um, and, and that sort of thing? I, I, again, I, I think if, if, if you've got the benefit of being able to have a one-way system at home, I mean, it may sound a bit amusing, but treat your home as a workplace because it technically is, I think, for this purpose. If you can, if you can instigate a one-way system, that's great. If you can teach near the front door and ask people to wait outside while somebody else comes out, let some, leave some time to clean, that is also probably a, a, a more suitable way of controlling that. And then I think fundamentally, if, if you've got, you need to think about the total number of people in that space and what ventilation there is and the risk. So if you've got a relatively small home with small corridors, in, in, in my mind, it's perhaps a little bit more sensible to ask people to wait outside than, than, than uh, because they may have come in a car, there may be a bus stop that they can sit underneath. If, if you have the space, let them in and ask them to wait somewhere. Um, try not to get people to pass because the whole, the whole purpose of this is one metre plus um, with additional controls or at least two metre social distancing. Mm. Thank you. We've got uh, another question. I, I, I'm going to possibly <laughs> keep this as the last question before we move on. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it goes because I, I feel we could probably spend quite a long time talking on, on this one. But another question is the view of the panel that private teachers should be implementing a form of passport by insisting that pupils should demonstrate clear results from lateral flow tests and how difficult or fair would this be to implement? So I think we need to be very, very careful because there are a lot of ethical questions here. That, <laughs> and, and this is a national issue, not, not just local level at teachers. I think you can certainly ask someone to, if they're comfortable, share, share their results and when that test was done. I, th I think that is a sensible approach. Um, and I've just double checked, lateral flow devices are freely available for everybody to get online in England. So again, that, that is, that is a, a great measure to, to, to control it. I think if, if you have somebody that is refusing to tell you, there is there's probably an underlying reason why, why they're refusing you, not necessarily because they're positive, but they just might not be comfortable in sharing um, those, those types of um, that type of information. And, and to a certain extent, I, I don't think you can push them to try and tell you, you'd need to make an educated decision on what's best for you and, and the, the pupil, um, whether that's the right thing to go ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to move us on to the next topic, but do keep putting your comments about this topic in the chat. And if we have time again at the end, we can pick them up and we can try to respond to them. Um, before we put, move on from this topic just now, um, John, you can perhaps keep us right in this, that it's the fact that not everybody can teach face to face in all four nations yet. Um, is that is that the case? Just to clarify that. Yes, that, that's right. The um, at, at the moment, um, you can't teach in indoors in Wales, I think, um, for except in very specific circumstances, um, and we've got these detail on our website. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a confused picture at the moment. I just wanted to pick up on something that that James was talking about. There, very quickly, if I may, um, just in terms of asking people for what's effectively health information, as you may know, under the General Data Protection regulation or UK GDPR as we now call it as we've left the European Union um, 
health data is considered special category data. So unless you have a, a good reason for doing it, we're not supposed to process health data. So we may need to help members um, by providing a standard sort of written policy that they can use, which is obligatory if you're processing this stuff. Um, so I will make a note of that. And perhaps, James, we can continue this conversation offline because it would be really helpful to talk to you about this in more detail. But there, there are some data protection implications here that we will need to think about. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully it won't be too long before in Scotland and Wales we are joining um, England and Northern Ireland in some more face-to-face -face teaching. Um, so let's move on to our next topic for now, um, um, which we're going to look at what will music teaching look like from August, which is generally after the summer when schools tend to go back to school. So August in Scotland, September, I think for our other nations. But what is the future of online teaching? Are we headed for a hybrid or face-to-face -face or online model? Um, this could be individual, it could be group lessons. We've all got different contexts. Um, so really, the future after the summer break, when we're a bit more <laughs> normalised, and there's this phrase, the new normal, which we're probably fed up listening to. But um, Sharon, would you like to talk to that that question? So kind of August, yeah. September, when schools are, are back. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think what the point that you've just made there is is very, very important because even when um, towards the end of last year, some instrumental teachers were going back to um, face to face lessons again, it was the one thing that everyone realized very quickly. This is not back to face to face lessons. Mm -hmm. This is a very different experience. Um, you know, you had all the screens, you had all the sanitization, you have, you know, are you going to um, leave that little bit of fallow time in between students, the cleaning time? It really, I think that is that is one of the first points to make that currently and for the foreseeable future from August and, and, and onwards, this, for as long as COVID is, is here and around to haunt us, we are not going back to face-to-face -to -face as we knew it before we went into lockdown um, at the beginning of last year. And that has just posed so many challenges to teachers. Um, I know even teachers going back, and you're mentioning this hybrid approach of where there's a mixture of face-to-face -face and online lessons, even just sometimes, um, you know, setting up a studio for one or the other is also very, is very different. So um, you need to be very, very organized in the way that that's done. So are you going to kind of have your online setup for one week, um, you know, with cameras and everything all ready to go? Um, and then the next week where you have got the screens, um, I think the, the expense of this comes into it as well because you know I'm a piano teacher so that is really meaning in an ideal situation you have two instruments is your room large enough to to cater for that um, if people as I know many teachers are working in peripatetically in schools what size of a room are you working in is there a window so um, I do think I mean I will come back to saying that um, obviously that I know about piano teachers the most, but I think it just goes right across the, the board for instrumental teachers. Um, but certainly piano teachers have become very, very adaptable. I mean, a massive cheer to the, the teachers and, and what they have been, been doing and achieving. Um, it's, it's quite interesting when we look back to the Victorian model of a piano teacher, you know, what did that look like um, back in the kind of, you know, the 1800s? And I think it's fair to say that if a Victorian um, piano teacher had walked into a lesson in January of 2020, it would have been really, there were a lot of parallels. So, you know, very much teacher-led lessons, uh, the master apprentice model, uh, quite a strong focus on reading notation and exam preparation. And then COVID happened. And suddenly um, we have things like, I feel more student-led learning um, because teachers have been in that very vulnerable position. Um, and I think sometimes I liken it to the experience if, 
you're familiar with uh, It's a Wonderful Life uh, with James Stewart. If you're aware of that old uh, black and white movie, um, it's that moment where they're all on the dance floor and the dance floor opens and there is a pool and people are thinking, do I jump in? And, and I think that is kind of very much like what it's been like for instrumental teachers. You know, do I go and get online? Because I, I can't, I can't teach unless I'm online. Um, so, uh, yeah, so more student-led learning. Um, I think where we have become much better at asking questions in lessons, um, giving more direct and more purposeful feedback. Uh, we have become a complete whiz at digital devices, um, technology. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, it's not as though it's not been there before, but it's opened our eyes as to how we can do this. Um, it's developed our listening skills, you know, whereas I know there could very easily have been that before, you know, looking at students, again, I'm just going to use the piano teacher illustration, looking at their fingers rather than actually looking at the students themselves. And, you know, that has changed. We've sometimes, you know, students will just set their iPad up and we don't you know, get to see the keys. We don't get to see what they're doing. So we've had to develop our listening skills and develop our planning skills. Uh, we've had to develop uh, multi-sensory strategies for learning as well, because we know <laughs> that lessons do not, online lessons do not work very well when, certainly for teachers, if you're sat there, you need to get up, you need to move. Students need to be engaged, you know, whether it's I don't have one right now, but whether it's a puppet comes up or something, you're doing something, getting them to say the letter names of a scale rhythmically and they stand up and they sit down just to get the moving there for both the teacher and the student, because otherwise it's a real struggle. We can't sit, you know, this is this is not what we're where our brains are built to do. So to keep firing up the brain. Um, and I know something at the Curious Piano Teachers, what we have noticed is the complete explosion, I mean, an absolutely phenomenal explosion of the interest back last uh, March, April in professional development and how do I do this? How do I do this better? Which I think up to that point is something that um, it, was, it was always very maybe easy, maybe too easy to put students in for exams and to keep parents happy and, you know, for there to be that sense of progression in that way. So, um, yeah, so face-to-face -face is not normal face-to-face. -face. It will not be, I, I, I'm guessing, for quite a long time, certainly as long as there is this risk um, of COVID and even knowing instrumental teachers personally who have, who have long COVID and they're out of work because they're really not well um, and the kind of the financial implications and the stress of that. And I've talked to teachers who've said, you know, I'm actually really scared of getting this long COVID because my family rely on me um, for, for income. So um, I do think it's a time to, to look at the research and to really challenge what we do. Um, I mean, like I've said earlier, we had this technology before um, and videos in any sort of instrumental lesson, it's so much more powerful than your traditional paper with pen notebook. Um, because of course, um, it's, you know, demonstration for us as teachers is a, it's not a cop-out, it's a vital part of the, of the learning experience. Uh, music needs to be at the heart of the lesson. So when we actually, before, were writing in a notebook um, to, to tell the people in words what to do, really what we should have been doing was taking a video. And of course, that is what teachers, that is one thing that we have discovered. And there are all of these digital resources. The one that I use is called Cadenza. There is something called a media annotator. Into that, you can upload videos. Um, students can upload their videos back you can literally in real time comment, you know, what do you think happened at bar eight? Um, and then the student will, will pick that up. These all existed 
before, but it is the situation that we've been placed in that suddenly we have, um, I think as, as a whole community of instrumental teachers, we have, we've just been pushed into to really taking it on board. And I think as well, and this is the importance of being part of a community and no longer being that instrumental teacher who works in isolation because that really doesn't work anymore. We need to be collaborating. Um, I mean, I know when Dr. Sally Cathcart and I set up the, the Curious Piano Teachers, um, it'll be nearly six years ago. And I mean, we thought, are we crazy? You know. Is this possible? Can we do this online? Because before we had been used to being in a physical room with, you know, with teachers there, with the piano there. Um, and, you know, little were, were, you know, little did we know that six years down the line, this is actually what learning would look like. But um, having those communities, um, it gives us the accountability. And I know for both Sally and I, it was that accountability of, is this a crazy idea? Should we do this? But we decided together to do it. And that's really powerful because I think it can be very scary. There's so many things that we would never do by ourselves if we're just by ourselves. And I know of other instrumental teachers who have set up their own businesses throughout, again, you know, as over the past year, um, responding to the sorts of um, problems that now exist and finding solutions and then going out there and creating online businesses. So I do think it's about, um, there, there are so many creative business opportunities for instrumental teachers. Um, let's maybe move away and rethink this kind of traditional one-to-one 30-minute -one weekly lesson. You know, what would it look like if we had online courses um, with peer support groups? You know, again, adults is really interesting in the US. Uh, apparently, the sale of pianos has gone up by 60 percent over the past year. You know, adults are, are coming back to this. Um, subscription based membership sites um, and again, you know, a hybrid lesson. So it's maybe, you know, rather than just one to one, maybe a mix of videos um, online group lessons, you know, where we can put our students into, into, into breakout rooms and they're actually learning collaboratively together again, not something that has happened a lot in the likes of piano lessons until this year. Um, and then, you know, yes, have your odd one-to-one um, -one face to face lesson, but maybe a mixture of, of online lessons as well um, with an online notebook <laughs> to support the learning. And I think it is, it is the time for us to really think outside the box um, because the opportunities are incredible. A year ago, we were, you know, our, our audience was, you know, is, is maybe, you know, people who with, live within a 20 mile radius. And now, I mean, I have students who are based in Italy, in Kenya, um, as well as, you know, the UK and Ireland, it is, it has all opened up a whole new set of possibilities, um, that parents are happy with as well. Sometimes they actually like the idea that they can be at home moving on with things and, um, you know, but kind of checking in with the lesson as opposed to actually driving to someone's house and having to manage the, the two other kids in the car. So, it's definitely a new world. And I think we have got to just be really excited and, and embrace it. But I do highlight the importance of being part of a community, connecting with others, because otherwise we will not believe in ourselves. We will lose the momentum. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That's some fascinating stuff just shared with us all there. Great to get some practical strategies and to hear really good examples. I was loving even the, you know, the we were writing our instructions in a notebook at the end of a lesson and now the just the really practical is, you know, real time commenting on video and, and things like that, which are right. fascinating. Um, I wonder, Steph, if you have anything that you want to um, add to the discussion on this one. Well, I mean, I, basically, I just want to echo what Sharon said about saluting teachers, actually, who've been fantastic 
um, and to hear these wonderful kind of creative responses to what's been a very traumatic situation, actually, um, I think is really, you know, some actually some very exciting things coming out of it. But I think, you know, Pauline, what you were saying in your introduction um, regarding online exams with, you know, some people have really taken to them and some people have found them incredibly challenging. Um, and I think that that's, um, that remains true. I think teachers have been absolutely amazing in adapting their methods and in preparing their, their pupils and candidates for exam. And um, there have been stumbling blocks along the way and some, some like it and some really don't like it. So it's a question of, you know, just as the situation is evolving, um, so I think we're having to learn to be uh, quick on our feet. Um, and uh, learn to adapt um, to the, the ch uh, changing challenges of the uh, teaching and the examining environment. Um, I think, you know, for my part as, um, as an examiner, at, certainly at, at, at Trinity, there are uh, very much pros and cons with, with online exams. And I think we've, we've touched on some of those in terms of, in a sense, the agency is given back to the candidate and the teacher in the sense that they control their own environment. So when they, they record uh, exams at their leisure and can upload at their leisure, um, they can record those exams in an environment that's chosen by them, that's comfortable for them. Um, but of course, you know, what's missing is that vital ingredient of interaction. I mean, many examiners will say that actually they love examining because of that interaction. It may be a very few moments that you get with a candidate, but for me as an examiner, it's their time. It's, the, it's all about the candidate in that moment. It's their time. They've practiced, they've rehearsed, they're, they're usually very nervous. They come in and often they actually really want to show you what they've done. And so for me, it, that's part of the privilege of being an examiner. Um, and so it's a, a, great, a great pity that with um, online exams, you don't get that interaction because you're sitting behind a screen, the candidate has recorded their exam um, and they're uploading it to an unknown person. So for me, as an examiner, the challenge is, how do you put that humanity into your response, into your report writing, um, into your, um, you know, what you can do to, to, to assure the candidate and the teacher that actually they've been heard. It, that's, that for me, that's absolutely vital because music will always remain a social art. And so how do we put that vital humanity into that online examining process? And I, I think that going forward post-COVID, um, we have learned a lot. One of the fantastic things for me about um, digital examining is, of course, I mean, I examine, and in the past, I've, you know, I've been overseas. I've, I've examined in India and uh, Hong Kong and, and um, in the Middle East, lots of different places. And um, what I'm very aware of with the digital process is that it's the same for, you know, for absolutely everybody. Everyone, every single candidate has got the same challenge of how do I operate the technology? Where do I point the camera? Um, how do I make sure that my hands are in view? Um, am I supposed to address the camera? Am I supposed to not address the camera? You know, all these, all these sorts of um, uh, different kind of individual ways of tackling things. And I think patterns are emerging from that. Uh, and there's there's a sort of um, um, there are there are ways in which um, you, you can almost tell when you when you've got a set of a run of candidates from a particular teacher because each of the candidates is prepared in a certain way, and then you move on and you think oh this must be a different teacher because you know they're behaving slightly differently. So again, I I think for me that's a very creative on grow, ongoing um, uh, process that. And, I, and I'm, I've been very struck by, um, during the pandemic, of course, we've all got a lot more used. We're, we're, we're talking to each other now online. We're on Zoom. And performers, musicians, composers have um, been taking to the online platforms in order to um, keep working, uh, producing their performances and so on. So in a way, 
For me, the, the digital online um, examination process is a way of actually helping to enable candidates, should they at some point, you know, you know, become um, it develop their um, uh, performing beyond that environment, to the to the joys of YouTube and you know different online platforms, which going forwards in our changed new world, whatever shape it takes, digital is here to stay. Thank you. Can I just jump in for a minute, Steph? Do you think yeah, sure. um, do you think it um, it will encourage people to do exams who would traditionally not have done exams had they been face to face? Yeah, you're absolutely yes. You're you're reading my mind. <laughs> Sorry. Because, because I think that um, um, it it it's it's almost enabling people who would uh, would never have thought. Oh, I, I you know the idea of actually going to an exam centre. Um, to go through the, the sort of formality of that, it's, I, I, th I really think it's actually opening up um, um, the possibility of sort of testing yourself out, you know, of saying, well, I, I, I like that repertoire, I want, I want to learn it, I want to see if I can pass that exam. It, it, it opens it socially, I think, mm. um, in a way that, I, that I, I find potentially very, very exciting. I saw a comment on Twitter yesterday from a parent, um, I, I can't even remember which exam board it was to be honest, but saying I hope the online exams stay because John or whoever it was um, really loved doing his exam online. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think that, I mean, for me as an examiner, I've, I've, I've done lots of online exams now and I really see that. Um, and, um, and I can see that... Um, you know, for candidates, especially if they're in their own space, as I've said, it, 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 it's, a, it's an encouragement somehow. It's, a, you know, we're, we're getting more used to kind of filming ourselves in different situations. And so it's a sort of natural extension, I think, for, for, for people, um, you know, to, to want to do that and maybe just up, then, you know, upload it to an exam board and see what happens. Mm. That whole, I think for me, that whole idea of social equality, of inclusion, um, is so, so vital. And if there's anything that we've learned through this pandemic, it's about the, you know, about the huge difficulties of um, um, social difference and the challenges that different communities are facing. So anything that we can do to enable um, communities and people who who not necessarily have thought or indeed had access to um, uh, exams, I think is, is fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to just move us along to the yeah, next sure. topic. Um, thank you. Um, we, did, we really have got so many things to discuss and there are more questions which I'll pick up on again um, very soon, but I'm going to move on to a topic in um, which John can uh, talk to for the next one. But this one is concerning um, music teachers. Um, and I'm going to ask you, but how has music teachers' pay been impacted by the pandemic? Just to completely change tack here. Um, the ISM have um, just launched their um, results of their annual survey, which was launched on Thursday. Um, and John, perhaps you'd like just to yeah. share a little bit on how it's impacted on, on teachers. All right. Thank you very much, um, Pauline. Um, the results were released on Thursday. For those of you that don't know, this is something that we have been doing every year for quite a number of years now. Um, we were very interested to see what would turn up this year as a consequence of you know, the pandemic and all the other changes that we know about and the impacts that we've been hearing about. Um, so the results were, were interesting. Slightly smaller sample um, size than previously, obviously reflecting some of the limitations of um, being able to teach in schools, for example, where, when schools close, face-to-face -face stuff not being available at various points um, and obviously exams being limited in some way but the, this it's still important um, for us um, to get a feeling for what's going on and we break the survey into several sections we look at private music teachers we look at part-time teachers who are employed in schools we look at private uh, part-time teachers um, in schools where they're self-employed and we, we look briefly at exams uh, examiners and accompanists um what's really the big takeaway from all of this and i'm conscious of, of time and the fact that the report will be available and the link um is going to appear below all this so uh, you can download it if you want to see it in detail but the big sort of takeaway from all this and it surprised us um was that hourly rates 
to pay have broadly held up. There hasn't been a market decline in any of the segments that we surveyed. Um, and in some cases, the median rates had risen slightly. So in private teaching, for example, the median rate for face-to-face -face teaching had gone, has gone up to £33 an hour from 32 We also asked people about online teaching for the first time, really, because it's, it's you know, had such a, a significance in the course of the last year as we've been hearing from um, fellow panellists. Um, the online rates, we were f terrified that it was going to be a race to the bottom, that prices were going to be driven down. Um, but in fact, the survey showed that the median rate is only one pound less than the face-to-face -face teaching. So we think this is really important because it tells us a lot of things. But one of the most important things is that the value that people at large place on music and music teaching. Um, mm -hmm. I think picking up on the points um, that, that Steph was making just now, um, but also Sharon in, in her... Um, analysis. There's been so much creativity, so much energy, so much courage by music teachers in making this work. Um, and likewise, we salute all of you who have, have taken to this. It cannot have been easy, but what we've heard time and time again, and just today in the last half hour, is the amazing things that people are doing because of the humanity and the belief that they have in music as a powerful, uh, an agent for powerful transformation, as well as a, an end in itself. I mean, <laughs> the fact that the rates are holding up, we believe is a recognition back of that from the, the public at large who want to pay for lessons. So it's very, very interesting um, that there is, is no kind of diving down of rates. Um, so, we would encourage you all to you know, maintain, see it as maintaining your value. Um, that's what we're getting back from um, these survey results. It's a really good story. I think at the same time, and again, picking up on the, the, the positives in digital, having overcome some of the challenges, is that the landscape is transformed. It's going to be part of what's going on forever now. It, it offers all sorts of opportunities that, that Steph and Sharon have described. And this is why at the ISM, we're thinking very much about you know, this whole digital transformation as central to where we go next in providing services to support you all. Um, so we need to understand the things that you're doing. So the opportunity to hear from specialists in the field is great because we've got lots to take away from this, but what more can we do to support you in this? Are there things that we don't know about that we should know about? you need to tell us because we want to hear because we want to you know, put you at the center of what we do as always um so your feedback is going to be incredibly valuable as we set about a digital transformation um to support you all i think just in terms of the fees um do read the survey um it's it's worthwhile it does give you a flavor it goes into um, more detail that may be relevant to the particular segments that you work in one caveat that i would make is um, this we can't set rates as a professional organization we cannot set rates because of competitional considerations we would be um, potentially we would fall foul of the competition authorities if we said the the rate that you should apply for this type of teaching is this um, so we do these surveys in order that we can inform you so that you know what your market value should be or what it looks like as a whole so you can apply that to your local conditions. Um, there are regional uh, variations in pay, which we go into uh, in, in the report, but it gives you the information that you need so that when you're negotiating your contracts um, and setting your fees or revising your fees, if that's what you're going to do, you've got the information to hand to help you justify it um, to your other parties that you may have contracts with. Um, so make use of it because it's a, it's a useful survey the sample size is a little bit smaller than previously reflecting what we've been through but it's still a valuable resource and i hope that you'll take advantage of it thanks john i do have another question um for you um hopefully we, we have time to discuss um kind of employment status and contracts but i do want to bring in um, another question because we've got quite a lot of questions um from our audience members so i think it's important that we involve them yeah um, so i'd like to just bring in this question um which is regarding videos is there a safeguarding aspect that we need to keep in mind um, and if we could probably <laughs> hopefully be a wee bit brief with these answers, because just so we can maybe get quite a few more. Um, Indeed. 
So, shall, I, shall I take that one? Would you like to take that one? Just very quickly. Um, yes, there are um, considerations that you could take in mind. And we actually have a page on our website um, called Safeguarding for Music Teachers Giving Video Lessons Remotely that looks at some of these things. And there's no great surprises in there for anybody. It's a lot of common sense, really, just thinking about what's the relationship that you've got with your pupil. Um, if they're a child, does the parent know that the lesson is, is happening online? Well, of course they do. What sort of um, account are you using? Are you mixing it up with your, your personal uh, uh, online accounts? Don't do that. Um, if you're going to film stuff um, and record it, which we've heard it's a great tool, get the agreement of, of all the parties involved and, and parents in particular, um, and just be businesslike, really. I would refer you to our website um, because there is a, a detailed page on that, which I hope you will find helpful. But yes, absolutely, there are considerations. So read further on the website and hopefully that will give you a view. If any members are out there um, who have further questions after uh, looking at all this, please contact uh, Legal at ISM and we'd be happy to help you. Thank you, John. This is not a question, but a comment um, from one of our viewers. The great thing about the online pre-recorded exams is it makes them so much more accessible to students who have long-term conditions and good days and bad days. So that's a really nice comment. And a question, Sharon, would you mind repeating the list of online facilities such as Cadenza, which you could use? If you could maybe very briefly do that, please. That would be <laughs> Yeah, okay, for sure. So yes, um, there is, I'm just trying to remember what I did say. So there's, uh, there's Cadenza. Um, there is something also called Rock Out Loud, um, which is, if you like, an alternative to Zoom. What they have been working to do is to, I don't think it's quite like you know being able to play duets or play with students but it's um it is very 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 good and they are in continuing to improve that i know zoom has improved but there are lots of things um and again i think it is just the the importance of being involved in in local communities because then everyone shares that's the other wonderful thing you find out about so many digital resources so hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and another question, I'll make this the final one for now. My school gets us to run an ensemble rather than paying room rental for our peri work. If I'm not yet vaccinated, I will be happy to do face-to-face -face individual work, but won't feel confident to run an ensemble. What can I do? I wonder if that's a question for John or... Okay. Yeah. I think um, if I can take it first from a sort of you know employment relationships, industrial relations point of view, I think the first thing that um, our correspondent should do is talk to the school. Um, mm -hmm. I think really just let them know that you're concerned um, and let them understand that so that they can work with you, one, to help allay your fears, but two, so that they can in involve you um, in moving to work towards an ensemble when you feel ready. So I think just be open about the fact that um, you have concerns. If you're an ISM member, of course, you can come and talk to us as well and we'll help you through that process if, if you need to, and we'd be very happy to. But just be open and honest because you're not going to be the only one in this situation. And I'm sure that the school um, will be experiencing this and they may well have policies and procedures already lined up in terms of phasing people into jobs that they're doing when they come back given the nature of the work so I think just try and start a dialogue if you need any help in framing that and we we can help you if you're a member just let us know um, we understand it can be difficult um, particularly if you're you know you're part-time and not a member of the permanent establishment um, we understand that so let us know but I think be open be honest talk about it you're not going to be the only one and, and then maybe from a, a physical control point of view I'll, I'll be super quick it, it is what I talked about earlier on. It's it's the distancing between people. It's the, the amount of ventilation that's in the room and is there good airflow. It's it's the typical things we've heard about hands and face, hand sanitization and face covering where it deems necessary. So on arrival, dispersal from um, during breaks, screens where you know where that is you know available and can be used, and then just perhaps working in in. Uh, set cohorts or bubbles as we know them as so that, that you're limiting the number of people and the changes of people in those bubbles so it's always a set group that you're you're aware of 
thank you. There's another question in the chat actually, which follows on for that. Will the will the requirement <laughs> a requirement, sorry, for schools to um, offer bigger rooms for Perry's from September, which is to do with size of space and, and so on. I, I, I think schools are, are, are possibly limited on space already in most cases, and and I, I think it's more of more of a what can you do in the space that's available rather than where can we procure other space? Because I think if, if schools start to procure other space, that'll, that'll um, remove some of the finances that they have available to pay peripatetic teachers and others, mm. so that they reduce the amount of lessons. And, and I, I think that would be a shame. Okay, we're gonna to have to be super, super quick here, John, with this huge question. So this is a bit of a tall order. Um, but right. um, COVID-19 has caused many schools um, and hubs to move teachers onto zero hours contracts um, and self-employed arrangements. So what do teachers need to know about their employment status and the rights and protections that they have? All right, this is a very big question. Um, I think I think that the headline that I just want to put up front straight away is, if you find yourself in a situation where you are being moved from an employment arrangement to something else, um, if you are an ISM member, please contact us because it may well be um, that despite any um, form of words that may be in the uh, revised contract that you're being offered or revised arrangements that says that you are self-employed, um, the reality may be that you are still considered as employed in law. Um, it's not an easy subject to, um, it's not an easy question to determine. It will turn on the facts of each individual case. But we would say get in touch with us because aside from anything, you may be being made redundant from your old job. Um, we need to know whether that's been conducted properly. Um, you may be um, still employed or you may at least have workers' rights, which is what um, has been in the news recently following the Uber case, which is actually a very important case. And there are a lot of parallels, I think, with um, many of our, our teacher members and music teachers generally. Um, there is a blog on the subject which I wrote that summarises the rights that you have as workers. And important among these are things like the right to receive annual leave, the right to benefit from the working time directors in terms of um, you know, the, the maximum number of hours of work, um, the right to employ pension contributions and so on, um, but also to a written statement of particulars from day one. All of this stuff is really important. You may still be entitled to this, notwithstanding what the uh, employer or the person engaging you is telling you about being self-employed from now on. Uh, but there's a host of issues that fall out of all this, which, given the time, we're not going to be able to discuss now. But the takeaway is, if something is changing from employed to something else, if you're an ISM member, get in touch with us. Um, if you want to find out uh, more about the rights for workers and the impact of the Uber case or the implications of the Uber case, um, our blog is available for everybody on our website and it may give you what you need to go and start talking to your employer. Um, but come and find us um, if you're a member because we want to help you. We're dealing with lots of this stuff at the moment in, in my team, keep them very busy with these cases. So again, if, it's, if something's changing and it's changing from employment to something else, let us know. Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Super headlines uh, there, John. Uh, we've got time to squeeze in, and there's there are still lots of questions coming oh, in. Right. So try and get through another one. Is it possible under the guidelines to teach from a rented room in a music shop, and what safety measures measures should be in place? Um, it, I'll take the um, bit under the guidelines. I don't know whether this is in England, um, but let's assume for the purposes of um, the argument uh, that it is. Um, I can't see any reason why you can't teach in a music um, space. But the issue then arises, what are the measures um, that are going to apply uh, in that space um, to make sure that everything is safe? So this is sort of James's area, really. And I think it's going to all the things that he was talking about earlier today will apply. So what is the what are the touch points? What are the routes in and out? Do people meet? Do is there crossing? What are the arrangements? So, James, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to that. But um, in terms of the space itself, providing it's COVID safe in England, there's a, I, I can't see there's any reason why you shouldn't do it. And I, I think the only thing really to add is, is what what is the in this if the landlord doing in some of the other areas that you might or your students might come into contact with that you don't have control over. 
So I, I think there's a bit of communication, communication and cooperation that needs to occur. And, and again, it, the best way to sort of document that is in a risk assessment. And there's a really helpful guide that ISM have put together based on the webinar that we did last, last August about how to do that. And, and that would ensure that everybody is aware of the controls that are in place, who is responsible for what, um, and fundamentally how everyone, including the, the people coming into the music shop, as well as the students that you're looking after are, are being kept safe so far as reasonably practicable to throw a health and safety legal limitation phrase on it. Thank you. Okay, we really are out of time now. So thank you very much, everybody. That's been a, a fantastic discussion. And I think just to try and sum up, um, as I think it was uh, Sharon who said that once we go back to face-to-face, -face, it's not normal face-to-face. -face. Um, so we've we've got had lots of things to consider this afternoon, um, lots of really practical strategies to, to keep us healthy, to keep us safe, but also to have lots of creative ideas for going forward um, to incorporate digital into what we do to make it part of um, more more strategies and more things just to, to go forward into the, the new normal face-to-face. -face. Um, so I'd really like to thank this amazing panel, John, Sharon, Steph and James, for their insights um, this afternoon. And thank you all for joining us and for your questions and comments. I think that's been a fascinating session. I'm sure we could go on for at least another two hours, but <laughs> wonderful session coming up this afternoon so thank you all for joining us and please do join us for the next session at 3.45 which is incorporating online work into your portfolio career so thank you all very much goodbye thank you